high above the Indian Ocean, disaster strikes. The engine's on fire! More than 10 kilometers in the air, all four engines of a British Airways 747 stop working. Roger, declare emergency. Mayday, 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 speedbird not... With no engines and little power, British Airways Flight 9 falls towards the ocean. Stand by ignition on. The crew fights to keep their plane from crashing into the sea. What has crippled their massive jet, threatening the lives of everyone on board? June the 24th, 1982. British Airways Flight 9 cruises through the sky over Indonesia. In a few hours, the plane and all 263 people on board are scheduled to land in Perth, Australia. Phyllis Welch and her daughter are seated in cabin E at the very back of the enormous jet. How's that heroine of yours, Fanny Price, faring? Oh, she's having a tough old time at Mansfield Park. <laughs> it's a good place for me to spend a few hours. Wouldn't mind being there myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Mum, we'll get there. We had already traversed at least two time zones. We were very tired. We had flown through Bombay, through Kuala Lumpur, hadn't been able to get much sleep, if any, and it was a dark, dark, pitch black night. Ahead of Betty and Phyllis, Charles Capewell is returning home to Perth, Australia, with his two boys, Chaz and Stephen. Right, settle down, lads. Come on. Time for a nap. Get back to your seat. No! What, do you want to sleep here? All right. It was a good flight. It was going well. Uh, leaving London was great and uh, we was all eager to go home and the two boys were eager to get back to, to mum. I thought, well, if we'd be home in three hours, Perth, they'll be back and we'll get in a taxi and we'll be home. While many of the passengers have been travelling for almost a day, the crew is fresh. They took control of the last stopover in Kuala Lumpur. Captain Eric Moody got his first taste of flying at the age of 16 when he took a gliding lesson. He was one of the first ever trained on the 747. Roger, check with Jakarta. Jakarta Control, Speedbird 9 over Halim at level 370. Speedbird 9, Roger. First Officer Roger Greaves has been a co-pilot for more than six years. Barry Townley Freeman has been a flight engineer on these aircraft for just a little longer. I'd not flown with Eric before, uh, or Barry. Uh, that was the first time we'd actually, we'd actually met on that, uh, that flight. As the jet flies over the city of Jakarta, it's cruising at more than 11,000 meters and has been in the air for an hour and a half. Captain Moody checks his weather radar. It shows smooth sailing for the next 500 kilometers. All right, Roger, it's all clear. Just keep your eyes open. I'll be back in a moment. Just got to use a loop. Back in the cabin, many of the passengers have fallen asleep. While Charles Capewell and his sons doze, an ominous haze appears above their heads. It's still legal to smoke on passenger jets in 1982. For the cabin crew, though, the smoke seems thicker than normal. Seems to be a lot of smoke out there. They begin to worry that a small fire may be smoldering somewhere on the plane. Maybe someone let up in the toilet. Let's go see if we can find it. A fire at 11,000 meters is a terrifying prospect. If there is a blaze somewhere, the crew must find it immediately. In the cockpit, the flight takes an unsettling turn. 
Barry and I were just sitting there minding the shop. Pitch dark night, of course. And then we started to get these pinpricks of light on the, on the windscreen. Is St. Elmo's fire? I don't think so. St. Elmo's fire is a natural phenomenon that's sometimes seen when planes fly through highly charged thunderclouds. But there aren't supposed to be any thunderclouds tonight. Anything on the radar? No. No, it's clear. I don't like the look of this. Let's get a better look out there. With the help of their landing lights, the two men are disturbed to see a thin layer of clouds surrounding their plane, even though nothing is showing up on their radar. But at 37,000 feet, the normal thing you would anticipate would be high cirrus, which is just a thin layer of cloud. I think we better get the captain back up here. I was reading my book and there was a slight flick of turbulence, just a slight flick. And I glanced over to the left where I had a clear view of the port wing. And to my surprise, it was covered in a, a brilliant white shimmering light which seemed to be clinging to the wing of the aircraft. I carried on reading, but I found that I kept reading the same paragraph over and over again and not taking in a word of it. I, I just didn't know what was happening. In the cabin, the smoke begins to thicken. Stewards have been unable to figure out where it's coming from. If there's a fire, they can't find it. Eh? All right, well, go see that the passengers are comfortable. anything odd, Mum? Seems rather smoky in here. I noticed that thick smoke was pouring into the cabin through the vents above the windows. And that was a very sobering sight. Turkish cigarettes. <laughs> It smelt like the sort of the sulfuric electrical smell. And I went on that flight deck expecting to hear that we had some electrical smoke somewhere on the aircraft. But uh, nothing was further from the truth. When did it start? Or well, just after you stepped out? Anything on radar? No, it's clear, not a cloud. Oh my lord, look at engine four! It's lit up somehow. Captain, Captain, have a look at number one. It's the same on my side. None of the crew have ever seen anything like this before. But the light show is just the beginning. Their bizarre flight is about to take a terrifying turn for the worse. Strange lights are striking the windshield of a British Airways passenger jet heading to Perth, Australia. At the same time, the plane's engines are lit by a brilliant white glow. Look at engine four. It's lit up somehow. This uh, light.